did not spare his son, but he gave his son. No more. Oh, praise God. First Thessalonians chapter 1. You'll be out of here in about 30 minutes. Don't worry. First Thessalonians chapter 1. Lawrence likes that very much. While I was with Dr. Hamby this week, this last week rather, he said something in one of our meetings that just registered so well. And I'm going to use that to start this message this morning. This morning, I want to speak to us on the other part of the message that we began at Labor Day weekend. On the, uh, Labor Day weekend, we spoke about the laboring to get into his rest. And we used 2 Samuel chapter 9, the story of David and Mephibosheth, to show us how much God loves us and how much God is calling upon us. And Mephibosheth's problem was understanding how much God loves him so much so that he could not he had difficulty in receiving what God had for him because when you read that story in chapter in verses 8 and 9 2 Samuel chapter 9 Mephibosheth said to David why are you doing this to a dead dog as I am he had an ID issue he saw himself as a dead dog when David saw him as a human being and for many of us that's the labor in our head that we must enter and resolve in order to take on what God has for us. So this morning, the other side of that message is labor of love. And that's what I want to speak on this morning. So Dr. Hamby, he made this statement. He said, the government of grace is dispensed through love. Wow. That's a very good summary of everything we'll be talking about for two, three months. The government of grace is dispensed through love, either through me understanding and receiving God's love for me, and consequently as a result of that, me being able to minister love to others. That's it. The government of grace being dispensed through love. So you and I really need to understand this love issue. We have to get it. Amen? Amen. All right, let me read a couple of scriptures here, then we're going to get into the message, labor of love. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all. This guy must be a Georgian. <laughs> <laughs> making mention of you in our prayers verse 3 is really where I'm going remembering without ceasing your work of faith labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father let me read one other passage in chapter 3. Same book, chapter 3. In verse 12. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you. Now, if you pay careful attention to that passage, the first one we read in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, it talks about the work of faith, the labor of love, and patience of hope. Three things. Faith, love, hope. Those three elements can be readily defined are the, as the three dimensions of grace. And it is interesting for me as I began to prepare and study for this message 
how many times the apostle spoke to the church and repeated this trinity of dimensions together. If you recall in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in verse 13, he says, Now abided these three, faith, love, and hope. He said, but the greatest of these is love. Then again, we go to um, the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verse 8. Nope, nope, nope. Where is it? Yeah, verse 8. He said, But let us who are of the day be sober, put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Colossians chapter 1, I don't want to read it. In verse 4 and 5, we see the same thing. So we see these three elements coming together. On and on and on. Faith, love, and hope. Now, let me just say at the outset that it is God that supplies the grace to accomplish all these things we are talking about. In other words, if God does not give the grace, you will never be able to walk in love. Let's just settle that up front. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Thank you, Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 9. Look at what it says. Verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things. There is nothing that God is asking you and I to do or be that he is not the one that's supplying the grace to do so. Now, let me go back to this foundation, to these three things, and then, and then we can dive into the message. Faith, love, and hope. Faith deals with the past. Past as in what Jesus has already done. It's accomplished. It is the foundation for everything that you and I will ever be. This faith is active and producing good works. Okay? It is with the past. Meaning all the things that Jesus, remember it is a finished work, it's already done, it's completed already. And it is the foundation. Love, on the other hand, deals with the present process. Mm. while faith is the foundation love is the structure that builds on that foundation it manifests itself in acts of kindness towards the human race and particularly toward fellow Christians it is shown by its toils and self-denials Faith is the foundation. Love is the present process that you and I are in. It is, is the structure that's been built on your foundation. It manifests itself in acts of kindness and it is shown by toils and self-denial. Hope, on the other hand, remember, faith is the past. Love is the present. Hope, thank you very much, Marjorie, is the future. If there was no future, we would not need any faith. We would need love. Your faith and love will crash if there's no expectation of a future. It addresses a future that is hope. It is the capstone of these three dimensions. It's that constancy which remains unconquered by trials and persecutions. In other words, when you're being tried, when you're in an affliction, when you're being persecuted, because there's a hope of something better there's a hope of a deliverance. There's a future in you and for you that speaks of better things than what you are facing in the present tense. Because of all of that, 
you can hold on. You know that even this shall pass. You understand that God is working something out in you for a better future. There's a hope and there's a future. Oh, just as I'm standing here, I just remember Jacob. In Jacob 42, uh, I said Jacob 42. In Genesis 42, in verse, I think, 36. Jacob was in such a dilemma. He said, Joseph is no more. Samuel is no more. And now you are asking me for Benjamin? He said, these things are against me. But now you fast forward to Psalms 148 in verse 8. Fire, hail, and snow. Stormy wind fulfilling his word. Oh my God. It's a fact. Joseph is no more. It's a fact. Simeon is no more. It is a fact. We are asking for Benjamin. But Jacob, you are looking at it wrongly. You are thinking these facts are working against you. But you need to understand that it's all part of the stormy wind that God is using to fulfill his word in you. There's a hope and a future even though things don't seem to be working right now. Amen. Hallelujah. The labor of love, it is always motivated by commitment, passion, and the pleasure that we have in God. Okay? And it refers to work done with that financial compensation. Let me just, let's just start breaking it down so we can understand what we're talking about this morning. The first example of parent of uh, I said, the first example of labor of love is so easy to find among us. Parental love. Parental love. The labor of love. I look across this congregation and I see all of you parents. What would you not do for your children when they cannot pay you for it? You run up and down from one activity to the next over and over and over even though you come home at night you are tired and say oh man this children are running me gragadi you do it again the next day and you do it again the next week and then you do it again the next month on and on and on and on it goes i know some women who did not work not because they were not qualified but they made a quality decision at that time based on their family situation to be at home so they can give better care to their children. You talking about labor of love? For a long time, she's not here right now, Ronke Balogun. I didn't think she had a, I, I thought she had no qualification because she was a stay at home mom. And then all of a sudden the kids grew up, she was working. I said, what, you, you, you know how to work? You know, you, you can be employed? But they made a decision. That while the kids were young, somebody would pay the price to stay at home. Can Mr. Dick is another one? Yes. Made a decision to be at home to take care of the kids because someone had to pay a price for which they not get the remuneration. Ah. It is called the labor of love. Now, as impressive as that is, and it is impressive. In fact, as, as I stand here, just truly, I just, I just remember just now, when my kids were growing up, my wife and I played different roles. We did all kinds of things. One summer, summer, one summer Tony was, uh, I think she was in the car. She couldn't drive. And she had to take summer classes in Decatur. I live in Bethlehem. Guess who was the designated driver? <laughs> my goodness, every day, back and forth. I mean, I, I take her to school. Hang on for two hours because I, I can't come to Bethlehem and go back. My older son played uh, soccer as a young guy. My wife and I. Every we, they never won one game. Not one. <laughs> Not one game. We didn't miss a practice session. We didn't miss a game. You talk about sad psalms at the at the, the blind just sitting down there. They they just run all over the. 
Live of love. <laughs> now, <laughs> I was that to say, as impressive as that is, and it is impressive, do you know it's almost on the lowest rung of this labor of love? Now, I commend what the parents do. I say that, and I want to make sure you understand that. I think it's awesome. In fact, in a few hours, you're going to see those football games coming on, and you're going to see all these big old men, 350 pounds, and six feet, six inches, and hi, mom. You, you understand why they say hi, moms? <laughs> Because when the fathers were out there working and slaving, it's the mother that took care of them, rubbed, washed their noses, put the food on the table, and all that stuff, and they remember that more than anything else. And they should. So parental love is one example of labor of love. But there are other examples that we see all through the scriptures. The one that comes to mind right now is David contrasted all compared with King Saul. Where David became a deliverer of Israel when Goliath harassed and tormented them. And as a result of that, he found a new overnight fame in Israel. And while the king should be happy that this David came to deliver them, he became jealous became envious, and the reward for David was assassination. I don't have time to read all the passage. It takes a lot of time. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, David sat at the table with King Saul. And King Saul could only think of, the, of, of all the accolades that David was receiving. And the Bible said they got a javelin and tried to pin him to the wall. What? You and I read that today and say, wow, what kind of madness came over the king? And the Bible said he did it twice. And then the third time, he did it again. What I'm saying to us about labor of love right now this morning is, how many times do you and I try to use a javelin to destroy other people? The javelin of our mouth. The javelin of uh, just a look, a javelin look. Just give you that look and it, just, it tells you where to go and how to get there and how long to stay there for. <laughs> Javelins are intended for destruction. There's nothing good about it. We pin people to the wall in arguments. David and Saul I am going to have the last word. I'm going to make sure you understand. I'm going to pin you down. I just want you to acknowledge and submit to my debate, my argument, my point. I want this point. I want it. Just say it. Let me hear it. Because I want to pin you to that wall. I want to use the wall as a symbol of my victory. So the next time we have an argument, I can record it. Do you remember that symbol? I pinned you to that wall. We're throwing javelins at one another when we should be loving one another. Now, in making this point, I'm, going to not, I'm not going to turn there because I want to save time, but I'm going to tell you this story. Because what causes damages in our relationships are simple little things if someone would just relinquish the right. If someone would just say, you know what? I'd rather be wrong, just be right. And let's have peace. If we can just understand something this morning that is not the issue of being right, that's not, that's not the point. Jesus came to Jordan to be baptized of John the Baptist. And as he walked up to John, John said, you've got to be kidding. My creator is walking to the creation. The creator of heaven and earth is walking to a creation to be baptized. What credentials will I have, John, to baptize you, my creator? Am I an apostle? Am I a bishop? Am I an archbishop? What qualifies me as mine to baptize my creator? So John immediately ceded his position 
to Jesus and said, Jesus, I can't do this. I can't touch it. You are bigger than I am. And therefore, I cannot baptize you. Jesus did not debate the fact of the argument. He did not say, I'm not the creator. He simply said to John, suffer it to be so now, so that all righteousness may be fulfilled. What's the point I'm making? It's a very simple point. Labor of love for you and I will cause us not to look at the rightness of the matter, but the righteousness. Oh. Rightness means, yes, I'm right. I know what I'm talking about. You are wrong. Da, 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 and on and on and on it goes. But righteousness says, what does God say? It's going to take a labor of love to reconcile that. If you go to your default of who you are, you, of course you want your rights to, to be upheld. You want to make sure you are not violated. And on and on and on it goes. But let, can I ask you a question? If Jesus had that mentality, would you go to the cross? If he wanted his right to be upheld, why should he climb a cross when he has not sinned? We want to be like him, that's what we say. But there's no being upon him, there's no being like him apart from the cross. And I can guarantee you, as he carried that cross to God, brother, he wasn't feeling fuzzy, warming, loving affection. There was nothing about the cross and the beatings he was getting that said, man, I can't wait to get there. No! No! But suffer it to be so that all righteousness be fulfilled. What am I saying? Parental care, yes, you see labor of love. But in human interpersonal relationships, there's envy, there's jealousy, there's arguments, there are debates, there are controversies, there are things that the enemy is bringing to divide us. You're going to have to make, the, your up, make up your mind that you're going to enter into the labor of love, that in spite of what you see with your eyes, in spite of what you're hearing with your ears, you are going to be like Jesus and say, Father, forgive him or her, for he or she does not know what they're doing. Oh, the kind of love I'm talking about excuses people's wrongs. You find a way to give them safety harbor. You are the one that said to them, no, 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 I know, I know, I know. Jesus said, Father, listen, listen. I know. Okay, tell me, what about the nail and hammer do you need to understand? They are nailing the man on the cross. And yet Jesus said, they don't know what they are doing. Are they foolish, stupid people? No. But that's what love does. It excuses the behavior of the other party at the expense of the person that's been injured. Hey, what I'm saying to you, listen to me, it's not because I read it. I'm telling you the truth. That government of grace can only be dispensed through love. We can sing about grace all day long, talk about grace all day long. If we don't get this part right, we will not see it. We will not see the manifestation of our lives. And I'm telling us, we need to start choosing righteousness rather than rightness. He said, but pastor, do you understand how hurting it is, how injurious it is to give up how right I am to that person to see in my position? Yeah, I know it's injurious. But ask Jesus about his injuries. Ask him. Let him show you the wounds on his hands. And on his side. When he was wounded for our transgressions. Bruised for our iniquities. And how the price for our peace was laid upon him. That by his stripes we may be healed. See, that part of it that wounds us, that pains us, is real. And I'm not sitting down here, I'm not standing up here trying to tell you it's not real. It is real. But you know what? That's how you and I partake of the fellowship of his suffering. We want the power of his resurrection. But we must be ready and willing to be made conformable unto his death. Partaking of the fellowship 
of his suffering. So in that hour, in that instant, when I'm giving up my right, oh, it's painful. My God, Father God, how can I do this? Come on, I'm right. Can't you see? can they see how right I am in this situation? But you give it up. And the pain of that giving up is working something in you to make you more like him. Since that's why you are here. You are here to become like him. So that pain that you experience is temporal, number one. It won't last forever. You think it is, but the truth is it won't last forever. It's working something for your good. That at the end of the day, you're going to see yourself more like him, more unlike the people that started out. Labor of love. It's all about choices. And God has given you and I that grace to make the right uh, choices. It's quiet here this morning. But hopefully you're going to go home thinking about what I'm telling you. Because it works. Amen. Parental love, we see that, labor of love, making choices to do the right things so that the children can progress. We see this relational love, we see David and, 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 um, and Saul, King Saul. The amazing thing about that whole story, David had the opportunity to avenge Saul's wickedness. Two or three times in that passage, David came upon Saul when he could easily have killed him. In fact, the man around David said, congratulations. Ah, this is the day of your victory. Let's kill this man right now and all our problems are over. Now, let me say this to you. If you have anybody around you saying things like that to you, to make you right and not righteous. Get away from them. They are the enemies of your destiny. They appease your flesh for a moment. But they, you, they, they will not help you get to where you're going. David read through that. And said, I will, I will not do this. And when you read that passage, David continued to increase in his success and saw God progressively worse. What life do you want for yourself? What life do you want? You need to make a choice. Was it easy for David going from cave to cave, living in wilderness, when he had been anointed and projected to be the next king of Israel? He knew that, and yet he submitted himself temporarily to a lifestyle that was not convenient. Why? Because he had a hope and a future. And he trusted God that if he allowed God to do what God began in him, God would bring him to where he needed to be. Amen. If God did that for him, how about you? How about me? Labor of love. It means you and I must make that choice. Our problem are between our two ears, our mind. Making the choice to say, you know what, this is what God says. It's painful, it's tough, but I receive the grace to obey God. At the expense of the pain that I'm feeling right now. So that you can come back and testify about how great and good God is. This thing works. It works. Last thing I'm going to tell you. Joseph. Joseph, the son of Jacob, betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, got promoted into prison, and then ultimately <laughs> became the second in command in Egypt. A man that went through those real life issues finally got a chance to see some brothers who did and perpetrated evil. Now, all of us in this room, when we put together all the offenses against us, I don't think it comes to one tenth of what Joseph went through. But we split ears, break fellowship over things that, that are really so mundane. 
by the grace of God, when Joseph finally came face to face with this man, I said to them, you didn't do me wrong. Do you see what love does? Oh, you guys missed it? He excused their behavior. He found a reason to excuse them so they don't have to think about that. You guys thought you sold. No, you didn't do it. They collected the money. No, you didn't do it. They butchered that. No, you didn't do it. I know about faith. I know about love. I know about the hope of the future. You didn't do it. God, in fact, sent me ahead. You didn't do it. Would you go home this afternoon and excuse your husband? Aha, uh -huh, it's quiet now. And excuse your wife. And make an excuse for them for the things they've done. Help them know it's not you. You didn't do it. You are better than that. That's what the level of love does. I said, but Pastor, I can't get it out of my mouth. That's tough, man. My wife, you know what she did? I can't get it out. <laughs> you start trying to do it. You will see how your goodness becomes the weave that God uses to change her. Or him. Joseph made excuse for those guys. You guys didn't do it. God did it. And then bless them. Show them acts of kindness beyond their wildest imagination. If you want to prosper, I'm telling you how you're going to get there. For those of you who can receive it, I'm telling you. The government of grace is dispensed only through love. Because Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciple. Not by your gift. No. No. Which doctors in my village, they, they work in gifts. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I thank God for the gifts. I mean, gifts are needful and essential. I'm not demeaning gifts. You, but you don't, you don't have to be born again to have it. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? The labor of love. The essence of all of it is making the right choices. And the labor there is, it's a struggle against your flesh, against your being, to accept the pain and the loss for a moment. The self-gratification, you lose it for a minute because you want to be righteous. It's a labor. It's a struggle. But if you take that and begin to use it today, this afternoon, tomorrow, next tomorrow, you're going to begin to see God move in your life in ways you have never imagined. It works. Are you hearing me? It's so simple. I'm done. I just want to pray a prayer. That God's grace over our lives will not be in vain. Yes. That the grace of God over our life will find an expression in Jesus' name. Yes. I know some of us are saying, Pastor, you are not in my situation. You don't know what happened. You don't know how it happened. I hear you. And you are right. I'm not in your situation. But one thing I do know though that the one that began a good work in you he can perfect it. And so Father we thank you for the grace of God that has appeared to all men. It is you that supplied the grace so that we can have all sufficiency in all things so that we, we can have good works. That's your promise. And so, Father God, we ask you this afternoon. Thank you for the manifestation of that grace. Thank you for the performance of your work. Thank you, Lord God, that the love of God that has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who sealed us on the, until the day of redemption, that that love will find an expression in each one of us. God, that will labor to make the right righteous choices. That even though it may look like 
were in pain for a moment after a while we have a testimony and so father we are thanking you now we are thanking you lord jesus that love will permeate our homes love will permeate every surrender love the love of god to us and from us will permeate everything we touch so that those around us will know without a shadow of doubt that we belong to you we receive that now we bless you forward we praise your name forever you are a great god in jesus name